Hi there, Chris Berg. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today on the Ridiculously Human podcast, buddy. Thanks, Gareth. I'm excited to be here. I was wondering, like Chris Berg, like the name, it sounds like a almost a Scandinavian surname. Is there any link there whatsoever for you? It is. Yeah. Yeah. My, uh, my dad's side was Scandinavian. His father came over um, from Norway in like the 20s, I want to say him and his four brothers and they have they have this really cool success story they all became these really incredible like artists and uh, one was a president of a university in Pennsylvania the other one was a world class stained glass artist and then my grandfather uh wrote uh like a dozen books on music um where he was a professor at the University of Illinois so it was like this cool immigrant uh success story wow has that uh, artistic talents flowed down to yourself? Not really. <laughs> I just have car washes. <laughs> I don't know where it went. <laughs> I wish it did. Uh, I do think I'm. I do think I have a creativity in there, but it's mostly doing like business and and uh, kind of like marketing and stuff. I have a creativity. I have a good creativity for product ideas, but uh, I can't draw or play the piano for anything so yeah I, I think those things like sometimes skip generations because my family like they also like a lot of them are really good at art or the piano mm -hmm. or guitar and I'm like I got none of that you know like even my dad he <laughs> he picked up the guitar at 60 and he was like amazing I was like how do you even do that in art as well and I'm like how do you even do that yeah. you know and um yeah he said to me he's like Gareth he's like we all have different like ways of being creative, you know? And he's like, I guess your way is through a podcast. And I was like, Hmm, I'd never really thought of it that way, you know? So we have different yeah. ways of being creative, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. We, we can express it so many different ways now. It's really cool time to be alive, but I, I wish I could do the guitar too. That would, <laughs> that would be pretty cool. My kids would love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's, just, it would just be cool to like pick it up and I don't know, have your mates around and go, you know, strum, you yeah. know, <laughs> just play a few tunes yeah. but but maybe in our next life or something that'll happen but <laughs> um, exactly. so i was wondering like have you had an opportunity today to hit the party yet because i've seen your posts recently that uh, you kind of start a lot of your days on on the slopes oh no not today i, I went uh last week we got a really nice snow uh we could go monday we had about almost a foot and hooked up with a friend and they actually got a bunch of snow this past weekend, but it was Easter and my kids were, you know, all about the Easter uh, bunny. So I haven't been in a little over a week, but I'm hoping to go this weekend. It's actually closing weekend here. So that's usually a kind of a fun party. Mm, yeah. I've actually never hit the slopes in America. I, uh, I've heard they are like massive and awesome. Uh, but, but compared to Europe, they, they say that the, the slopes there are a bit more fun in Europe, like in terms of the partying and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have, I have not been to Europe. I've been to uh, snowboarding in Chile, which was really cool. Uh, but yeah, we've got all kinds here. We've got little bunny slopes, little kind of neighborhood ski mountains. And then you've got the mega resorts where you can go, you know, there's 5,000 acres or whatever. So we've got the gamut. We like our little local small mountain. It's very family friendly and very chill. It's not, it's not very expensive and there's not a lot of amenities, but it's perfect for us. Yeah. So do you normally go there with your kids? I go there with my kids. Yeah. Um, I go by myself too, because there's, there's nice snow, but um, I'm close enough. You know, I, I've been to Aspen uh, a couple of times this winter and we can get to tell your ride and places like that easy enough, but I'm, I'm at the phase where I kind of like the smaller mountains. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Happy days. So Chris, yeah. I wanted to start this off with like a, a feel good story, uh, considering the type of stuff yeah. that goes on in the world at the moment. And, you know, in America, yeah. it, it feels like there's a, there's a bit of an immigration issue uh, just from the outside, mm -hmm. you know, from, from news and whatnot, but you have yeah. actually a couple of really cool stories to kind of like counteract that almost. I think you have a couple of guys, um, Iran and Eduardo that, uh, yeah. that work for you. I don't know if you would like to just sort of share that story. Cause I think it's super cool. Yeah. It was it was interesting about a month or maybe two months ago now, somebody um, put a one star review on our car wash 
and said, there's these guys hanging around. And we said, what? Who's hanging around the car wash? And so we uh, dug into it and our attendant showed up and he said, yeah, well, there's these, these guys, they just offer to drive people's cars off. And so we weren't sure what was going on. They don't speak any English. So through Google Translate, you know, like hold up the phone, talk into the phone and then uh, go back and forth. We realized they were here from Venezuela. Uh, they were effectively homeless and they had no car or anything. Uh, they had been bussed in, you know, like so many are now. And they were just saying, please, can we help you at your car wash? And we said, well, we don't, you know, we really don't have capacity to hire anybody. But if you wanted to help detail people's cars, um, that's fine. As long as you're not aggressive with it, you can't scare people. And so we repositioned where they were so they weren't quite so like in people's faces. They actually are positioned now when people come out of the car wash. Um, so it's not so in your face, but they're right there. And they say, you know, they just offer through sign language effectively. Can we dry your car off? And can we really, and then they, they'll do like a full detail and they're doing it for tips. We're not paying them anything. And the, uh, the car wash customers just, just tip them out and they are very, very happy. I'm, I'm not sure how much money they're making or, or any of that, but, you know, they help us clean up the car wash a little bit too. And, and they help us keep it secure because our attendant's not able to be there all the time, but it's just turned out to be one of those things where it's a net benefit to everybody. Now our customers love them and we've gotten actually a five-star review saying, thank goodness these guys are here. I didn't want to dry off my car. I didn't want to wipe down the glass and these guys did it. Um, for tips. So it's, it's a pretty cool story. You know, I, I consider myself a patriot and this immigration thing. I think something's got to give here. We've got to fix it somehow, but it's, you know, it's easy to forget that these are re real people, you know, and they're, they're hungry and both uh, physically and emotionally hungry to, to help and to become Americans. And so I don't know if we're really helping do that, but I think it's a cool story. And and we love them because they're keeping our customers happy and they're helping us around the car wash a little bit. So um, I don't know what the long-term future is for these guys, but for now, it's a pretty cool story. That's super cool. And there's even like a better story uh, with, I think his name is Muhammad or Mu uh, and yep. a, a guy that you found effectively on Odesk, which was one of the, or was the original, yeah. that was the original name of, was it uh, Apold or what is, what is the, the site called yeah. now? It's called um, Upwork. Now. Upwork, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so it was Odesk and there was Elance. There was all these sites. So back in 2009, when I first got into online businesses, Odesk was the place you went and it was, stood for Offshore Desk. And um, I needed somebody help. The, the, Facebook was brand new. And they had just started creating pages for businesses. Before that, uh, people, if you had a business, you would just kind of sign in. You would pretend you were a person, but call it after your business. And Facebook realized that it didn't really work. So they created Facebook pages, but you still needed to know HTML to do anything back then. There was no builder for it. There was really no template. And I didn't know HTML. So I got on Odesk and found Muhammad and his, his handle was really literally page designer. Uh, and if you go, if you were to find him on Odesk right now, you would still find him under page designer, uh, even though he hasn't done that in years. And so he started helping with the Facebook posts and the Facebook pages. And then I just realized over the years that I would throw these problems at him. You know, I had a WordPress site or I had a shop. It wasn't Shopify at the time. I had a WooCommerce store, um, you know, I had a shopping cart and had all this stuff online and I didn't know how to do any of it. Everything I thought threw at him he never said no he never said no i won't that's not my thing i wouldn't do that and he'd come back usually about a day later and it'd be done and so he just kept growing his role growing his role and we would keep paying him more and i would talk to him we would chat through skype and um you know he was he'd be working at all times and i said do you have a day job and he said uh yeah i'm, I'm a doctor and i thought you know doctor of what like doctor of philosophy or something you have like a history degree or something 
And he said, no, I, I, I'm an ophthalmologist. I'm an eye surgeon. And, you know, we were about a year into working together. And I said, yeah, sure, buddy, whatever. That's cool. You go do your eye surgery during the day, whatever, man. And because, uh, you know, if you've worked with offshore people, you know, there's always a little bit of a maybe a little bit of a BS factor there. You know, it's fine. You get used to it. But this was this was kind of wild. So we would still talk and then we would we would jump on a video call and there he'd be in scrubs and he'd have his little name tag. And then he'd talk about a surgery he had just done. And finally, we were on the phone one day and he walked by the certificate on the wall. I said, hey, what was that? And he says, that's my that's my MD. That's my medical degree. And I realized, and he sent me a link to his clinic. I realized he was actually an eye surgeon and he was just fixing our silly websites at night. As side work, he was making three or four times what he was making as an eye surgeon with us because uh, we were, we you know, we were paying him a fraction of what you'd pay an American designer. And I wanted to, to hire an American web designer, but you just couldn't find them at the time. There, there was wasn't people who could do all this. And they were very, very siloed. This guy only does WordPress. This guy only does SEO. This guy only does shopping carts. Where with Muhammad, I just threw it all at him and he just figured it out. And, but he was making so much more fixing our websites than literally saving people's eyesight. So three years ago, um, I just asked him, I said, hey, Moo, would you ever want to come to America? And he got the biggest smile on his face. And he said, I was hoping you would ask. And I said, okay, well, I don't know how, I have no idea how to do that. Let's, let's figure that out. So my business partner had a friend who was an immigration attorney and he referred us to another immigration attorney. And they said, basically, this is how it works. And so it's such a study in contrast. I'm really glad you brought this up, Gareth, because Eduardo in Iran went through this horrible, arduous journey crossing from Ven to get to Venezuela to the United States might be the scariest thing you ever had to cross on the planet Earth. There's the Dorian Gap is this jungle. It's this massive canyon that you have to swim around or, or get a boat around. And then the Sonoran Desert in northern Mexico in the southern United States is probably one of the deadliest places in the world. And so they just walked here. And so now we're trying with Muhammad. We're trying to get him here and we're going through the legal process. We're now two, two years into this and the hoops we have to jump through and the things that we had to advertise for a job and we had to pay all these fees and you're constantly waiting. Everything is of a wait of like nine months. You fill out a form, you hear back in nine months. But we applied for an H-1B visa, which is basically there's, I think there's 100,000 given out every year and there's about 400,000 applicants. So you got a, like a 25% chance and it's literally just a lottery and he scored, he got one. So he's coming. He's going to be here probably somewhere around October. And um, I can't think of a more qualified dude to bring to the United States. He's an eye surgeon who can do every kind of web program you can possibly think of. And so, and ironically, his wife is a, uh, is an eye surgeon as well. That's how they met in the clinic. And so she's going to get a, uh, a work visa as well. She'll be, she'll be performing eye surgery as well. She's actually passing her medical boards right now. So it's just an awesome story. I mean, you know, super hardworking. Like he, he literally works 16 hours a day, a lot of times. And like, just the study and contrast of like, I, I'm a huge believer in immigration and, and immigrants specifically, but you couldn't really pick two different kinds of people. They're both going to contribute in their own individual way. And I think in a lot of ways, that's what makes this country great. And you can, you can quibble with how they got here and, and, you know, how we should be working and dealing with these people. But fact of the matter is, is that these two sets of people are, are going to be here. And I'm really glad. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it sounds just like amazing, you know, and, and I guess, are they going to come work as eye surgeons or is well, going to work? Mohammed will have to maintain his work for us. The way the visas work, we're basically sponsoring him. So he'll have to work for us. So we're hoping that his wife will get a job in an eye clinic. 
and then Muhammad uh, will will maintain his hours with us, which is really probably it's probably only about twenty or thirty hours a week with us, and then he's hoping to get some uh, part time work as an ophthalmologist. So we'll kind of see how that works. Uh, he will have a work contract for us, so he'll have to work for us for uh, probably four or five years after he gets here. But uh, his, his fortunes are just completely changed. Pakistan is a very difficult place, as you can imagine, to live. There's constant power outages. Uh, they have a really unstable currency. Um, there's seems like every four or five years there's a military coup and one leader's deposed and the next leader comes in. And it's just a tough place to live, as you can imagine. So um, he's very excited and he has two little boys who uh, don't quite understand what's happening, but <laughs> he says, we'll be closer to Disneyland. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but that's so cool. Thanks for sharing, man. That's literally life-changing stuff. And I think like if, yeah. if everyone can do something cool like that in life, you know, to help each other out, even if it's just something tiny that you help each other out, like the world would be mm-hmm. such a, a great place, you know, if we all just did that little bit, it would be, it would be super cool. So, so thanks, man. Yeah. I, you know, I've been doing entrepreneurship for 21, 22 years almost now. And the money's great. I've, I've got a great lifestyle. We get to take all these cool vacations and I'm putting in a swimming pool right now, as you, you may hear in the background, (laughs) you may hear some beep, beep, beeping, but the things that move me now are this sort of life-changing stuff. We're going to change Muhammad's life. Maybe we're doing a small thing to help Eduardo and Iran change their lives. I have a supplement company where we're changing those people's lives. I get, I get uh, testimonials from them almost every day of people who, Oh, I didn't have to get knee replacement surgery or, Oh, I don't have to use my Walker anymore. Or, Oh, my blood sugar is finally fixed because of these supplements that you have. And that is way more gratifying than anything financial right now. And that's, that's something that I'm, I'm actively focused on. We can talk a little bit in a little bit about my breakthrough organization um, where we're doing these retreats for mental health. And that's that business, quote unquote, it's a quote unquote business. It will never make a dime. The profits will be laughable. Uh, if there are ever any, but it's the most impactful thing I've ever done in my life. And it's easily uh, the thing I'm most excited about. Yeah, I absolutely want to touch on that. I think, uh, you know, what you're doing there is uh, very much needed um, in this uh, in this day and age. So, so I definitely, definitely want to hit on that just now. Uh, Great. But I just wanted to say, like you wrote that uh, you grew up like a, a middle class um, and uh, your parents taught you like three critical life skills right and they Mm. were fierce work ethic and independence a diy mentality uh give back no matter how little you have to give um i was just wondering like was this like you you learned that through them actually teaching or was this just you like almost in observation of their actions it was it was a little bit of both um there wasn't a lot of extra money um, so anything I wanted to do, if I wanted to go on like a ski trip or there was a class trip, my parents never said no, but they said, you got to figure out where to get the money from. You know, one of the, some of these trips were pretty expensive, hundreds, sometimes thousands of dollars. And they said, you can go, but we don't have the money. So you better figure out how to do it. So that was where that independence and that work ethic came in. They said they would throw ideas at me. Well, you could get a job. And I got a job when I was 12 years old at a veterinary clinic. And I was an only child. So I was also a latchkey kid. If you're not familiar with the latchkey kid is basically you just go home after school and you're by yourself. And I just learned to take care of myself. And my mom would call right before she left the office every night. My parents both worked. She would call about five o'clock and she'd say, okay, get out a pan, put it on the stove. Put, a, put about, uh, fill about halfway up with water, start the boiling. And when it's boiling, go get those noodles and throw it in there. So I would have to start dinner. And by the time they get home, it would almost be done. And so they just taught me just, my mom would always say, you want something to happen? You have to make it happen. Make it happen. So there was this sense of independence and um, grit that I just had to have if I wanted to do these things. And so 
that was the best gift they could have, could have given me. Um, neither one of them had an entrepreneurial bone in their body. And so it took me a while to realize in my 20s that I was just not wired to work in corporate America because I was instilled with this insane, first of all, a great work ethic. I was willing to outwork everybody. But I was also, I just kind of wanted to do my own thing. You know, I felt I knew what was what needed to be done and what was the most effective path. And I was probably a little bit cocky. And I just realized that corporate America was just stifled. It crushed that kind of ethic. And so that independence came out, that work ethic came out. And I realized, man, I, I just need to go out on my own. I just need to start my own business or buy my own business. And so I've never looked back, but I did not grow up with that entrepreneurial bone. And so many entrepreneurs say, oh, I started selling candy in second grade or whatever. I was the biggest fundraiser for the church or whatever. I started knocking on doors when I was 12 or whatever. I did a little bit of that, but I wasn't particularly good at it. <laughs> so um, they just instilled in me this, this need to, to be independent. And then my dad was constantly filling his uh, free time with volunteer work. And he did not make a lot of money. It's not like he could donate a lot of money. So he just volunteered his time. He was on a million committees. Uh, he was helping put on the parade and, and doing the fundraiser. And he was active in the local theater. He did like the, all the lights and stuff for them. He just, it was just pure example. He never told me, he says, well, this, this is what you should be doing. You know, uh, every Thanksgiving we would go to the Salvation Army and and strip turkey and stuffing, and there was never any kind of pull me aside and teach me a lesson. It was just this is what you do, this is how you be a good human. I always think that that's actually the best way to lead is just literally through action, and yeah. uh, because at the end of the day, I mean, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're a little kid, if you're an adult, uh, you 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 watch what people do, you know, and you kind of like, right. if it resonates with you, you're like, cool, well, I want to do that too. And um, yeah. at the end of the day, people also don't like being told what to do, you know, they're like, okay, right. don't worry. You know, so like the more advice you give, the more they're like, well, I'm not never going to do that thing. So, <laughs> so totally. yeah. leading through action. And I mean, that's, that's like obvious, like just see, seeing some of your posts where, you know, I think you donate blood and you go uh, help the, the yes. homeless and feed and stuff. And it's just like, well, it's in your DNA. That's because what your your folks were doing and your dad was doing. So um, good lesson in there for all of us. Yeah, we are so fortunate. Um, me, especially my family and all and all that. So we, I make a concerted effort to know. Because, I mean, everybody sort of worries about spoiling your kids. You know, my kids have so much, so much opportunity. And uh, they're so lucky. They're so much better off than I even was that I really want to instill in them this no the knowledge of how lucky they are and how horrible some people have it in the world. And so that's why we go to the food bank and we give out boxes of food. Very, very satisfying. Um, and we do other fundraisers and things. And I'm we're getting more into that. My son's 10 now, so we're just going to do more and more of that. And, and the blood is like the easiest thing in the world. It takes... 20 minutes every eight weeks and think about what else could you do that took 20 minutes didn't cost a dime and could literally save somebody's life i can't think of anything else and i know so few people that do it i think a lot of people are frankly afraid of the process but it's talk about impact i mean it's, it's massive yeah huge impact one of the things that which you just kind of touched on now that I, that i'd like to know you you've obviously done very well for yourself and you know you you spoke now about uh, about your kids and, and teaching them like how do you keep your kids grounded when you have like done so well and you could literally just go here it is kids he has everything you ever ever need like there's, there's it's a juggling act i'm sure it is um I'll tell you one way we do it, and pardon my French, but I literally have my son shovel shit. <laughs> That's, I mean, you talk about staying humble, right? Like, he's got to go out and clean up after the dogs, and uh, he empties the trash. Um, and so, jobs, basically, is how we're doing it now. Uh, the volunteering, for sure. 
And then we are constantly reminding them of how lucky it is we are that we get to have these adventures. We get to, we're going to go to Disneyland this fall and uh, we get to go on these amazing trips. Like when I was a kid, the notion of getting on an airplane was completely foreign. It was, that was what businessmen did. You know, you didn't, you didn't fly for family travel unless grandma and grandpa were paying the ticket. Um, you, we drove everywhere and that meant everywhere, like, you know, thousands and thousands of miles. And so every time we get on an airplane, I say, man, you know, this is really lucky. We're going to be where we're going to get where we want to go in two hours. It used to take two days. Uh, and it was really, you know, my son, he's one of these guys like, are we there yet? You know, we'll be, we'll be a half an hour into an hour trip and he'll be complaining and, and we'll tell him, you know, like, man, when I was a kid, we, we would drive eight, 10 hours to see my family and turn around and just come right back. You know, it was, it was wild. So it's just a, uh, it's subtle reminders and it, you do it through your actions, like the volunteering, and then you kind of make them do crappy jobs. <laughs> <laughs> figuratively and literally <laughs> yeah literally um, that's classic it, but also those long trips that you're talking about like i mean that resonates so well with me like that's exactly how we used to travel in, in south africa and um yeah i mean but i've got such great memories about road trips you know like, like the, the 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 food we would make before you know and you'd like I don't know, you'd be like 30 minutes into the trip and you'd be like, come, let's eat, let's eat. Let's, you know? <laughs> and then you'd, you'd have to wait a bit and then you'd stop off at like the picnic spots in South Africa. And oh, it was just, I mean, I have great memories about the car trips, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, they're probably missing out on that a little bit. I, I try to instill in them some boredom. Uh, we take away the screens and and they complain about being bored. And I say, good. I want you to be bored. You need to explore boredom and explore your own creativity. You don't need to be constantly served, you know, it, the next video or the next video game or the next whatever. You you need to let your mind explore. And that's that's something that we, we're trying to do more and more. But it's not easy for sure, especially with this, you know, this crazy world that we have now. But it's something that we really encourage them to do. I'm so glad you said that because I've actually like also thought about this a lot. And I, I really think like boredom is one of the most important things we all need to almost like uh, sort of schedule into our day because mm -hmm. that is where the creativity happens, you know, like you, because if you're not, then you're like, okay, cool. I'm on screen and I'm on this website and this social media thing. And I'm just like inundated with information and my brain has no idea how to process that. And it definitely has no idea how to, stop and think and recalibrate and go okay cool what is it i'm actually doing here um so super just important lesson think, yeah just thinking time um for me that that thinking time is so critical because I, I never solve the big problems sitting in this chair staring at the computer it just doesn't happen like that for me i'm out sometimes it's on snowboard or sometimes it's on the mountain bike sometimes it's a lot of times it's driving for whatever reason my mind really goes over time on thinking and driving. My business partner takes showers. Like if we've got a big thing, he might take, we got a big problem going on. He might take five showers a day. Um, but we just don't schedule that thinking time anymore. And I think it's really, really critical. And I, it's it's hard to do. You've got to break out of the location that you're in. you got to raise your heartbeat a little bit. I think walking is great for that. But uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's absolutely critical. I, I actually do some of my best thinking on an airplane because a lot of times it's just me and a notepad and it kind of shut the world down with some noise canceling headphones and there's nothing to do but listen to your brain. <laughs> and it's great. It's great because you, I write and I, and I think that. So I love uh, jumping on an airplane for a couple hours because there's you're in this just isolation chamber in a lot of ways there's the, the only thing to do is think yeah exactly you're forced to do it and i think that's uh yeah it, it's it's such a great place to get into i actually find that personally if i go for a run i always like that's where my ideas come and i'll be like i have these like amazing ideas and i'll like oh yeah. flip, how am i going to remember this one you know and I, then i forget all of them so by the time i come home well I, I actually take my phone with me and I'll, I'll just like kind of like put a note in my phone. But saying that, I don't know if you've seen on, on Twitter in the last week, there's a guy and he's coming on the podcast soon, uh, Eric Kaiser. Uh, he's, yeah. You've seen that crash memory thing. I think that's amazing. Yes. That's, that's such a good idea. That's really cool. 
Yeah, I I just use voice memos on my phone, but I'm it, he's got a great plan where it'll transcribe them and send them to you and log it for you. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely going to look at that. That's a great idea because audio is so much better for me. You can just do the stream of conscious thing. Um, I'm recording voice memos both for me and my business partners. Um, I'll just have this sort of stream of consciousness like, hey, you know, what about the strategy? And I'll just sort of talk it out. And, you know, sometimes it's so hard to sync up with people, right? Like, do you have time for a phone call? And then you spend, like you and I have spent the last month trying to schedule this podcast. And I have people on Twitter that have been trying to schedule a phone call with me for weeks. And it's just easier just to trade voice memos. And so I love that audio component for capturing ideas. And I'll be really interested to see the launch of that. Yeah, I think he's onto, onto a winner there. That's for sure. Talking yeah. about kids, um, one of the things that you've written is about like every job kids should do, right? So you almost, oh, yeah. I guess, set them up in life. And, and you, you said like they should do hard, dirty sort of work, like farming, landscaping, cleaning, um, dealing with the public, either waiting or checking staff, uh, sales, yeah. like commission-based or door-to-door -door or knocking on, you know, fundraising, that sort of stuff. And yeah. um, you just said it lays a great foundation for uh, any sort of career. Um, yeah. I was just wondering though, like, the world is quite different these days. Do you find that those opportunities definitely still exist for kids? Yeah, I think so. You have to look for them harder. But um, yeah, I mean, for me growing up, um, I worked at one of my teacher's farms and that that work, hard, sweaty work just taught me, it really pushed me in school. Because I realized if I screwed school up, that's the kind of work I was going to do for the rest of my life. And so, yeah, it, those de those jobs definitely exist. And uh, my son's going to be doing them. He's doing them to some degree now. But they're out there. Yeah. And and sometimes you don't get paid for them, right? Like uh, go to Habitat for Humanity and build a house. It's the dirtiest, hardest work you might ever do. And there's there's no paycheck. So that's definitely out there. And then, you know, as I got into college, I transferred i started busing tables at pizza hut and realized that as hard as the manual labor was um it was so hard dealing with the public and dealing with people um crabby or just sort of not so bright people or you know purposely uh cruel people there was there was just this whole part of humanity that I hadn't really experienced. And I don't think you get unless you're working at a reception desk or answering the phone somewhere or waiting tables that will give you so much empathy for that part of the workforce, which is a massive part of the workforce. Like these service jobs are, I don't know, 40 or 50% of the workforce. So knowing how hard it is to wait tables, you know, I mean, so many, I can't tell you how many people go, I've seen go into a restaurant and say, what's the, why is it so slow? And Where's our waiter? And I'm like, you don't understand how hard this job is. They're on their feet, moving for eight hours, dealing with people just like you who don't think their job is very hard. And so I think that's critical. And then the sales job, um, tr convincing people to do what you want them to do will make you really, really rich. And sometimes it's, it can be anything. You can do it in a corporate job. You can do it at W2, but you have to influence people to your way of looking at things or to do what you want them to do. And so that's what sales is. And you don't have to actually be trading a good for money to be, to need to be uh, skilled at sales, right? You just need to be skilled at influence. And that's what a sales job will do. And there's nothing that will sharpen that tool faster than door to door going door to door or cold calling and getting rejected time and time and time again and realizing that until if i can just say this first and just grab their attention and stop that door from slamming then i can explain to them what i want and i, and I did it raising money at school and like i said i wasn't that good at it but it taught me about the power of of sales and, and influencing people so yeah, I think those three things, my kids are definitely going to do them. I'm going to make sure of that. 
But I think if you had on some level, those skills, appreciation for hard, dirty work and a good work ethic that goes along with that appreciation for how to deal with the public, the people, and then how to influence people, how to move them in the direction you want them to go. I think you could do anything. Besides like the hard, dirty work, uh, almost everything else is a soft skill. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it is quite amazing these days how many people lack those soft skills, often due to kind of like technology, you know, because right. you don't really have to do that a lot of the time these days. Um, you know, even communicating right. with people, you don't learn that, that sort of really critical and key uh, way of being um, because mm -hmm. you, you don't talk to people. You just like message them on your phone. So soft skills right. are huge. I, I look back, like I was a waiter for five years and now just listening to you say that, I was like, wow, that actually really helped me. I hadn't even really even thought about it, how it's helped me in life, you know? So, right. So, right. You learn about people. And I've always been like fascinated by people and uh, interested in like psychology and stuff. And I was like, oh, maybe it was because I had to deal with all those assholes <laughs> and I was a waiter <laughs> of course there were some great people too you know but there was a lot yeah. of like you said rude bastards as well <laughs> yeah yeah and, and there's a there's a component of sales in being a waiter right Absolutely. Yeah. trying to you know get your get your tickets to be higher and get them to give you a better tip and stuff yeah you got to influence them a little bit it's so there's huge some influence sales. yeah just like you yeah. know being a good person managing your own uh emotions and how you respond yes. and whatnot, especially if you treat it badly and whatnot, you know, you, it, it, there's so many skills in doing that. So yeah, no, that's, that's, right. a, that's a good reminder. There, there was, there's a cool story that you have actually, that's, I don't know if you can run through it quickly. It was like when you did a, a mining job, um, I think it mm -hmm. was like you were almost an intern there and uh, mm -hmm. you managed to like automate a part of their process oh, and they had yeah. no idea about you doing it. I was like, what? that was cool. Right. <laughs> Right. I kind of figured out early on that I was a little bit lazy. <laughs> We're talking about work ethic. Um, but I realized that I was the kid who would, everybody else would just get to work, you know, laying the bricks or whatever. And I would take a step back and just kind of look at it and be like, how could we get somebody, how, we, how could we get the machine to lay the bricks for us? Or how do we speed this up by 10 times or two times? And that skill, I don't know where it came from, honestly, but that skill really served me well. So I had a, an internship. I was a mining engineer, went to this gigantic mine, and I thought I was going to be working with all this cool equipment and blowing rocks up and driving huge trucks. Instead, they shoved me in the literal basement and had me um, renumbering these drawings. There was thousands and thousands of these shop drawings on the computer, and they wanted me to change the naming convention. The most boring dry work you can possibly imagine. It was literally grabbing the drawing, erasing one number, putting in a new number, and then filing it. And it was so, it was brutal. At the time, that was my first internship. I didn't realize that companies just give you terrible work just as a test to see if you're, if you're going to stick around. They do this all the time. I could not fathom that when I was 21 years old. Why? You're paying this person and you would intentionally waste their time. <laughs> but companies do that every day, all day. And so I thought this job really needed to be done. And so I figured out that this program, it's called AutoCAD. I figured out that this AutoCAD program would do it for me. This is like 1996. That's probably common knowledge now that it'll do that. But I worked in a room full of draftsmen and they didn't know about that. I asked a couple of them, I was like, did you does this work? And they were like, oh, I've never even seen this. What are you talking about? And so I tested it, went into the lab, figured out, did some little programming. And this job that I think it was taking me like five minutes of drawing. It took, after that, it took about five seconds, I think it was. This job that would have been done over months, maybe years, was done in a week and a half. And I went into my boss's office and I said, it's done. And they laughed, you know. And I realized they told me later that we had no, we knew you weren't going to get that thing done. We just wanted to see how long it took you to complain and ask for something else to do. And so I was like, what? How? I didn't understand that mindset at all. 
but you know, it, it's like hazing in the corporate world. So when I had it done, they were blown away and they, they started, they had me write some of these programs for some of their other projects. And then I got instantly promoted. They put me out in the field where I wanted to be all along, uh, working with the heavy trucks and all this stuff. And so it was just a quick lesson in like, find a better way. Like these jobs, so many of our jobs and our tasks are just sort of dumb and repetitive and frankly unnecessary and so now every t job that comes in i look at it and my job is you know kind of the ceo or co-founder guy is to say okay first of all does this really even need to be done what is driving this if it does need to buy, be done who can do it besides me because i don't want to do it <laughs> and how can we speed it up how can we get 80 percent of the results with 20 percent of the effort and that's that was really the Pareto's principle has really, really served me well in my career. And I did that over and over again in corporate America. And I, it really shut me up the ladder. Kind of blows your mind a little bit about uh, the corporate world. And, uh, you know, there's so many sort of, I guess, inefficiencies in the corporate world. I, I worked as an investment banker yeah. for 20 years and I was blown away at how manual um, investment banks were. And I mean, I'm talking about the most complex trading desks in London, uh, yeah. they would, they would be so, uh, manual in terms of their processes. And you'd be like, what you guys are, you guys have got like 2 billion pounds on your book here and you're just doing everything like on paper and stuff. So it's just, it's just crazy, but like, it didn't make any sense, <laughs> but, uh, but that's just kind of, I don't know. That's just the way it is sometimes, you know? So, yeah. uh, Adam Rossi has, has actually got a, a question for you. He he's, was in the oh, okay. podcast uh, recently and, and he said, yeah. uh, you have a cool origin story uh, about buying an excavation company uh, from buy, biz, sell uh, for not a lot of money that he yeah. says worth, is worth hearing. Yeah, so um, I was working for this big construction company in Alabama. We were building this massive tunnel and water treatment project. And all my bosses were on the take. They were actually rigging the bids and stealing money from the project. And it was just a completely corrupt setup. Uh, the county commissioners were stealing. It was this massive, massive grift. And so I, I was dating one of my boss's daughters. And, you know, I was in the middle of Alabama. Like, no offense, Alabama, but I just was not wired for that environment. And so uh, one day I just quit my job, dumped my girlfriend, loaded everything into a truck. And about six hours later, I was on the road. And I just, uh, I just said to hell with it all. And the FBI showed up about eight weeks later and busted all of them. A lot of my bosses went to jail. A lot of them turned state's evidence. And you can still look it up. It's the Jefferson County uh, corruption case over the sewer treatment plant it's if you google it, it's still there um, a lot of guys went to jail and so i got to back to denver where i was from i had no job and no prospects and all my references from the two years previous two years were either corrupt or on their way to jail and i was like i can't really how do i fill out a resume on this you know um and the, all the jobs like every job i ever had i really i was always frustrated with my bosses because i felt like they just couldn't they were they were in love with busy work and i felt we could get so much more done if we focused on the important things i thought we were wasting so much time and so i just kind of realized well the only way to fix that is if i'm the boss and so when i moved back to denver i moved in with a guy who had had the exact same experience. He was just a year ahead of me and he had bought a lube oil shop, a Valvoline oil change center. And um, he was doing pretty well. He got an SBA loan and he gave me his SBA contact and he says, you could do this too. Um, and so I found this tiny little excavation company on bizbuysell.com. Um, it was for sale for $180,000 and the guy was making $60,000 a year out of it. It was just him and like one other worker. So I was literally buying a job, but I didn't know any better at the time. And so got the SBA loan and I got into it and realized immediately, like 
I couldn't run the machines and grow the business at the same time. I had to get out of the, the machine and get in the truck and start selling more work. And so just like six weeks into it, pulled in a guy who was kind of a laborer. And I said, can you run this thing? And he said, yeah, he couldn't wait to run the machine because he had been on the dumb end of a shovel for two years. And so I just instantly promoted everybody and hired a couple more guys and started going to chase the work. And so I grew that business. We started at 180K revenue, grew it to 2.6 million in four years. And the funny thing is all we did to grow was we just did what we say, what we said we were going to do. We showed up when we said we were going to show up. We performed the work we said we were going to perform and we sent a bill. And that right there is so lacking in the construction industry that we couldn't help but grow. We was we got more work than we could we knew what to do with, uh, especially in that particular niche we're in with excavation for water and sewer lines. So it grew, but it was um, it was incredibly stressful work. Um, I didn't know how to delegate, and I didn't know I didn't know anything about running a company. I had never I had never done any of that. So I was I got uh, got my butt kicked in a lot of ways. And so realized four years later, I was just stressed out and working too much. And my girlfriend at the time, who became my wife, said, uh, you know, you don't have to do this forever. You know, I, th I thought I was going to grow it into this $100 million company. And I was going to be this big shot excavation guy. And I realized all my personal goals were serving the business. And I realized if I was going to be happy, the business had to serve my personal goals. And so right then, I uh, decided to sell the company. It sold about four months later, 2008, 2007, I guess. Um, sold it again on Biz Buy Sell. <laughs> and um, yeah, we, my wife and I literally moved off the grid. We moved into an off-grid home in the middle of the mountains in Colorado and lived off solar and wind power for the next 13 years. Wow. And that's where you are now as well. No, we we left that four years ago because we were we were ready for some <laughs> we were ready for something different. Where we lived got an insane amount of snow, and we got tired of the climate. So we we're back in a better climate, but we're back in the burbs too. Ah, wow, that must have been a, a super cool experience. Uh, so, was. Adam, uh, the other question that he had uh, was if what what advice do you have for uh, young entrepreneurs like similar to yourself like that uh, don't have access to startup capital what kind of advice would you give them um i think you can start really really small um i have i have told this to some friends of mine i i am a mentor for a kid it's through the big brothers big sisters program I've known him since he was nine years old and i helped him start his cabinet company and so he started that with about uh, four or 5,000 bucks. So you don't need a lot, um, but he had me to help him start with that. So if you don't have that, honestly, if you are super young and tech savvy, I think you could put an ad in the penny saver or Craigslist or the church bulletin board saying that I will fix your computer. I will install your ring doorbell. I will install your Simply Safe because there's all this new tech, right? There's the Nest thermostat, there's the Ring doorbell, there's the Simply Safe cameras and alarm system that's supposed to be dummy proof. But there's this whole generation of people, namely me and your parents, probably Gareth, right? They can't do it. They just they, they'll never figure it out. They don't have that baseline technology knowledge that would allow them to install a doorbell, right? Uh, and and then get the app going on their phone and sign up for the, all this stuff, right? So for $0 startup costs, I think you could start that business and start making $100 an hour. I think you could easily charge $100 an hour to do that. And as long as you know how to install those things, which is all over YouTube anyway, uh, with, a, with a little bit of tools, maybe 100, 150 bucks worth of tools, uh, maybe with a drill, 200 bucks. But that's that's the sort of college. Back when I was in college, it was a painting business or it was a moving business, right? That's what everybody started back then. Now I think that that's the equivalent of that. I think 
you could easily make a very high hourly wage and you would get referral after referral after referral. And somebody would say, hey, can you fix my email or can you get my printer to work or whatever it is? You would have endless work. And it's no, it's not particularly fun work. And a lot of people push back when I say that, say, well, it's not scalable. So what? You In the beginning, you're going to do things that aren't scalable. That's the whole idea. If you're looking for the next Facebook or the next Bitcoin or something, it's not going to happen. You need to do things that aren't scalable in the beginning and that you just get, you need cash flow right away, right? So find something that somebody wants you to do right now that will give you money for it. And what I think people can do who have a W-2 right now, who actually have a job or a career and they want to start something is look at your current company's profit and loss statement or their current balance sheet or whatever it is. Look at the vendors that they use and the people that they employ and look at something and say, there's something on there. There's something that somebody that they use, some service that they have to have that sucks. They hate it. It's a third party. It's a SaaS. It's, it's the guy who's emptying the trash at night or it's the, the person who comes to do this. This is their only business and they suck at it. And look at that and say, I bet I could do a better job. And that is a simple way you could go to your, go to the powers of B and say, what if I took this over as a weekend side gig nights and weekends you pay me instead of paying these guys i'm going to do a way better job and then maybe that is scalable maybe there's other companies that need that right so that is also another probably zero or low cost startup idea um you just got to find those first paying customers and find find that gap find somebody who's doing the thing but they suck at it and improve on that <laughs> Improve on the experience, maybe charge a little bit less, maybe you charge a little bit more, but that's the easiest way to start a business now. Yeah, I really like that. I've, I've heard some guys talk about even starting like uh, businesses, mowing people's lawns and, you know, they get yeah. paid great money in America, especially you get paid great money to do that. So it's, uh, it's nice. It's outdoors, I guess, for, you know, at least in the summer and uh, yeah. guys earn great money, you know, especially if you're a youngster. And yeah. there's, once again, like you said, it's not necessarily scalable, but it no. uh, teaches you a lot of other skills, which is, um, yes. which is what you're doing, you know? So that's you really You got to cool. let go of the, of the scalability requirement when you're starting out. You just don't have that luxury. And so I, I, that's not even something you should consider in the beginning, I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, they get, like, I think people get stuck. Uh, in this sort of belief that almost everything also needs to be scalable because of the world we live in, you know, like you just yes. see all these tech bros and, you know, making yes. so much money. And it, it seems like that everyone's doing so well, but actually it's not necessarily like that. You know, it's also taken them 10 years to get there and three, uh, they've been broke three times in their life. And you know, I mean, nothing is really as easy as it seems. That's for sure. Yeah, startup culture kind of, in a lot of ways, ruined entrepreneurship for a lot of people because they have this vision of, you know, you're going to work on this thing, software or some, a website or an app or something that has this hundred million dollar or billion dollar capacity or potential, but you're going to have to just pour your life work, you know, your your life into it for the first five or years years or something, but then you're going to be really rich. And most startups aren't like that at all. Um, unless you're in Silicon Valley, most startups are you finding a product and trying to get it developed in China or something, and or finding, creating a service, buying a pickup truck for it, and just working your butt off, but you're getting paid right away. And it's not going to seem scalable. But the vast majority of businesses out there, I, I was reading something recently that I, I think 85% of small businesses never even reach a million in revenue. And so you could make really good money with a company that has five or $600,000 in revenue, and maybe just a couple other employees. You might put half of that in your pocket. I know people that are doing that right now. Um, doesn't that sound pretty attractive? 
for a lot of people. You know, it doesn't fit the narrative, but it's actually awesome for a lot of people. And that sort of money, you, you're you already in, I guess, almost the top 5% sort of thing anyway, you know, like, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. You might be in the top 1%, depending on where you live. Yeah, I mean, you can make a fantastic income. The, the startup culture is kind of, look down on a lot of the baby boomers who have a plumbing company with three or four trucks and they think, Oh, that guy, why didn't he scale his business? And it turns out that guy's pretty smart. He's making a lot of good money. He has very little stress. He knows his four or five employees really well. He doesn't worry about them very much. He trusts them and he makes a fantastic income. Uh, there's a ton of entrepreneurs that could benefit from just doing that and stop worrying about, giving, having a nine figure payday or scaling beyond $10 million or something like it doesn't have to be like that. That's why I've like really enjoyed chatting to Adam. Uh, I, I've just, I'm launching with, uh, Chris, uh, Hellgate this week, the, the Gaspers guy. Oh yeah. And, and now, and now yourself, you know, like you guys are yeah. just offering like real life, uh, advice, you know, that's, that's not like, okay, yeah, try scale your tech company and, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's actually yeah. all these other businesses that are actually super lucrative and um, they might not yeah. be in the millions, but like you said, still you're taking home 300 grand a year, you're doing bloody well for yourself. Um, yes. the rest of the, gener the, the, the population. And, yeah. um, so it's great advice, you know, like really gives people that little bit more to think about. So I really dig that. Yeah. So Chris, uh, adult loneliness is, is a big issue these days, right? And they actually say that loneliness is one of the sort of main causes mm -hmm. of people getting old as well. Um, right. And uh, you've actually experienced this firsthand uh, and you wrote yeah. a long tweet about it. I just want to read the beginning of it and then, yeah. uh, and then we can sort of go through, go through that a little if you don't mind. So you said, oh, no. some people on here have been talking about adult loneliness. This hits home for me big time. See, in 2018, my wife tried to throw a birthday party for me. She could not get one single person to show up, not one person. One of the saddest days of my life. So, yeah, do you maybe just want to sort of run us through that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So we were, we were living off the grid at the time uh, in the mountains. And so we'd kind of isolated ourselves a little bit geographically. And we'd had quite a few friends, but they had kind of moved away, moved on. And I was working from home um, and all my employees were remote. They were overseas. And so I just had gotten kind of isolated and I stopped um, going into town that much. And uh, I thought I was sort of this lone wolf. I thought it was cool, you know, that I didn't need friends and all this stuff. And I kind of had this manliness thing, like I'm this independent guy, you know, I'm living off the grid. And, and then this birthday party came and I just felt like a complete loser. We could not get a single person to come to this thing. And I believe it was my 40th even, and I think it was a significant birthday. And, um, it was, it was just really sad. It was incredibly depressing. And I realized that I had, I had sort of worn this cloak of like, I'm an introvert. I don't like going up to strangers. And then I realized that I was using that as an excuse just to, to not talk to people and to be weird and off, you know, off by myself. So I decided right then that I had to fix this. I liked being around people. I liked having friends. I liked having parties and we just hadn't done it in so long that I looked at it hard and I realized that, well, I had a lot of friends, but I never called them. I never, I never went to see them. Why would they come to see me? And so I just started, it started off with reaching out to the people that I already knew. And I would have a funny memory of, oh man, remember that time in college when we, we got drunk and, you know, went off in a car we, we did a bunch of illegal stuff you know and so i would text those people say do you remember that i can't believe we did that and they would do that with high school friends and that just led to some cool conversations um some late night calls and laughing and then um i realized i wanted to see these people more and so i just started traveling 
I would I would go specifically to see one person. I would fly to them or I would drive to them. And I realized I wanted those relationships. I wanted to maintain them. And if I was if I was gonna have them, I had to make it happen. Again, make it happen, right? They weren't going to volunteer to come to me. They weren't going to say, hey, let's let's have a reunion. So I just started putting together these little reunions. I started getting my old college buddies. We flew down to Austin, Texas uh, a couple years ago. And uh, just we just did one night, just did one night. And we stayed up till the dawn talking and laughing and creating a complete ruckus in this hotel. But it was one of the most cathartic things I've ever done. And um, so reaching out to old friends. And then I realized, well, I wanted new friends too, because I was living in these locations. And so I realized that I was a terrible listener. And that small, I hated small talk because it was always the same questions. It was always the same answers. What do you do? Where do you live? And everybody kind of pretends, oh, that's interesting. And then you sort of wander off and yeah, say, I'm going to go get a beer and go to the bathroom. And then you, and then you get into another one. That's the exact same conversation, right? And so I started kind of studying on this and realized that if you wanted people to be interested in you, you had to be interested in them first. And so I just started asking questions and I would ask people, I would still ask them, what do you do? But then I would follow it up. Well, how did you get into that? And then I would, I would kind of go backwards in their history. I would say, okay, did you study that in college? And that would spark a conversation about college because almost nobody does what they studied in college, right? So you, you dig into the college life and and then we'd peel it back even further and say, well, what did you want to be, you know, when you were growing up? And then you'd really get into their hopes and dreams and you'd get this history of them, of where they lived and uh, what, what they wanted to do with their lives and everything. And I would just sit there and listen and I would let go of any notion of them asking about me. And I would stop trying to get to my part, right? That's what so many of us do. Is we're not really listening. We're waiting to talk. And so what would happen is just active listening, like you're doing right now, Gareth, uh, you, your eyes are bright, you're nodding, you're smiling, like you're clearly listening to me. That's what I started doing with people. And I noticed instantly that people liked me more, for one, and that they wanted to hang out more. And so eventually they would ask about me and I would get to tell my stories. Some of them didn't. Some of them were just completely self-involved. And I just let those people go and never contacted them again. I didn't have really any interest in hanging out with people like that. But the vast majority of people had, first of all, if you really dug into them, they had very interesting lives and they did really interesting things. And so then we'd eventually get into their hobbies. What do you do for fun? What are you excited about? What are you really looking forward to these days? And it was usually something to do with a hobby. Maybe it was river rafting or motorcycle riding or camping somewhere, or backpacking trip. And then the natural progression was like, hey, I'm interested in that stuff. We should, maybe I'm already doing it. We should do that together. Or, hey, if you get an extra spot in your trip, I'd, I'd be interested in going. And I would just start getting invited to all this stuff. And before I knew it, I had four or five trips a year with people that I had just met. And I was forging really close friendships with a lot of these people. I got really close to most of the people I hang out with. I've only met in the last three or four years. Uh, one was a business partner now. Um, and other people I'll go to the middle of the wilderness in Utah with for four days. And then these other guys were going on a whitewater rafting trip for four days. And so um, I just opened myself up started listening more, asking interesting questions, let go of trying to impress people or trying to tell my story all the time. And uh, it's really enriched my life. I have some tremendous friendships. I feel like if I was in a pickle or if I you know, was in a bad spot, I'd have 20 people I could call. One of the things that the podcast has taught me is how little we know about our friends that we've grown up with. Right. Yeah. So like I've actually had like, I think four, five, six of my, my mates like that I grew up with on the podcast and oh, wow. 
like I didn't know about their stories, you know, like I'm, I'm like now I'm 43, yeah. you know, and you know, I was like, yeah. hang on, how am, are we this age? And I never knew that you lived in Mauritius and your grandmother looked after you and you, you loved like go-karts and like, it's so crazy, yeah. but how we go through life and we have these almost high level relationships where you, you know, you great mates and you do lots of things together but you don't necessarily right. ask the questions like, Hey, tell me a bit about your parents or like, what was your childhood like? Right. It's weird that we just right. don't do that. You know, we, right. and, and when you do start asking those questions, you just have this, well, one, you have a deeper relationship with your friends and two, you understand them better. And you, you probably have like a, like, it's probably going to be a longer relationship too, because there's this deeper bond. So yes. really important lessons right. there in our friendships. Totally. Yeah. Totally. So you now host these uh, mental health retreats for entrepreneurs yes. that you, that you touched on a little bit earlier. And yeah. I know that you like, well, one of the things you also do is like around psychedelics and stuff, but do yes. you maybe just want to talk a little bit about what those retreats are like, and yeah, yeah what, what sort of do they all entail? Yeah. So, um, it all started with a tweet from my friend Sam Leslie, um, who posted something about Colorado legalizing psychedelics. And I DM'd him and said, have you ever done anything like that? Because I actually took uh, quite a few psychedelics in college, sort of as a party thing, and then had done it throughout my life. And it had really kind of changed my perspective. And I thought it was a really powerful thing and a net positive for me, for sure. So I asked Sam what his experience was. He had zero experience. And I said, um, well, I could probably make an experience happen for you. I happen to know a uh, some people in Utah who were putting on those types of experience. I said, we could probably just make that happen. And so we partnered up on it. And uh, actually, almost exactly a year ago, we had our first one with Sam and three or four other, let's see, four other entrepreneurs. And... Um, we so basically you travel we like to do it kind of in the middle of nowhere so you can get out from civilization so you're not kind of surrounded by the hustle and bustle so you can get into nature a little bit the first day um everybody gathers and we get to know each other with some exercises and we talk about our past and we talk very much about what we'd like to get out of this and so we're it's very intentional it's not a party scene there's no alcohol uh, there might be a little bit of cannabis for some people, but for the most part, this is about getting better with your mental health. And so people think about their intentions for months beforehand about what they want to accomplish. So we call it breakthrough because people can achieve, achieve massive breakthroughs. And um, the first night we take a, a smaller dose, it's usually psilocybin, which people probably know as magic mushrooms which is an incredible, incredible compound. There's been uh, studies done by Johns Hopkins now uh, on, on radical shifts in how people think. Um, people who are dying of cancer no longer fear death. Um, people who have a very severe history of PTSD and anxiety, depression, practically cured after one session. Not all of them, but many of them. And actually three quarters of the people they study, they study say that just one session with psilocybin was one of the most important events of their entire life. And so uh, the first night do a lighter dose and people people trip. They, they really get through uh, some layers that have been building up in their brain. They're, they're able to excavate some stuff that they've buried basically. And it's a lot of things that we don't even realize we buried some, maybe some life experiences. Sometimes it's trauma. Sometimes it's just wounds that we've covered up and covered up and tried to forget that once we deal with them, we can really get over our stuff. I, I like to say that we, it's a, it's a weekend of getting over your bullshit because a lot of people get over these things that have held them back for a long time. And so, um, that goes the first night. And then the second day we get up and we have a big breakfast and we talk about what happened and people's experiences. And um, then day two, we, we take some more uh, psilocybin, take, usually take quite a bit more day two. Um, 
and that starts in the early afternoon and that can go into the into the night till about midnight and that's when people can really have um they can have breakthroughs and they can have uh challenging times too some people have a quote unquote bad trip but those bad trips are actually the most important trips um because those are the most impactful when you have some darkness inside of you when you have some negative emotions in there if you can let those out and talk about what caused that and talk about why you haven't been able to deal with it is so cathartic um, there's also a lot of giggling a lot of fun we have people who literally roll on the floor and laugh we have people that dance and um it's a lot of fun it's actually a way to let your mind play a little bit we're so serious in our careers with our families and people who do this kind of thing are very intentional they're trying to live their best life they're trying to get to the top of the pyramid and they don't just we talked about earlier with the time to think they don't let their mind play and psilocybin is really a way to let your mind do that you become more creative you might find an artistic expression um you might find some creative solutions to the problems you've been having but it's been radically transformational for the people who have taken it. We've had a war veteran who was uh, frankly suicidal and on a kind of, he was on kind of the standard cocktail medications with the SSRIs, antidepressants and anxiety medications. And he's been, he went to a session last April and then he's been going to sessions on his own. He's completely off all medications now, no more suicidal ideation no more suicidal thoughts. His business is radically different. Um, he didn't really even have a business a year ago. He was trying to figure out what to do with himself. And now he has a thriving business that is extremely impactful in its own right. And we have another guy who um, realized that he had just never, he had gone to work basically when he was 16 years old and had never stopped. And just was just go. And there was zero time for fun, zero time for play. And he had a, a big family, lots of kids. And he realized he was driving them into that same sort of misery. And he now they play. Now they go on vacations. Now they have fun together. And he's allowing himself to relax and to enjoy the fruits of his labor. I can't believe how many people just don't do that. Um, and then there's other guys with problems like you know a lot of people come to these meetings with the scale or sell problem with their business i'm bored do i just get rid of this thing now or should i take it to the next level um so a wide variety of issues that people come with but what everybody walks away with is clarity clarity on what i need to do now what my what my, what issues are holding me back and what what i can do to live this life that i'm actually dreaming of and and am i am i striving towards the right goal even because like we me with my first business i thought i wanted this gigantic company i wanted all this growth i wanted all this money and it took me a long time to realize the money's nice but it's worthless if i don't have time to enjoy it you know so those kind of the the vision that you want to set for your life becomes a lot clearer so we have a session coming up in July. Um, we have one slot left, I believe. Um, would love to have you or one of your listeners find out more. You can go to breakthrough.so, breakthrough.so. Um, it tells you about the program. And um, we vet people very hard that have come this. We can't have people that have a history of psychosis or um heavy diagnoses like uh, schizophrenia or things like that. That's for the safety of the staff and for the safety of, of the other members, obviously. Um, I'm getting a certification in psilocybin facilitation. So we have qualified people there. And it's just super impactful. And it's one of the, hearing these people's stories is so inspirational that it, I just want to do more of it. I want to help more people have these breakthroughs. Certainly is life changing. Uh, I have some some mates who who do similar stuff, and you know it's those stories that uh, 
I guess that, that keep them going as well, you know, and like make everything right. Okay, cool. This is definitely something that I, I want to carry on doing, like being of service to these people. And, you know, there's so much there, like you said, the clarity that people get. I mean, so many people just, they don't have that in their lives, you know, and, and they might seem like they, they're doing so well and they've got all this money and all the mm -hmm. toys and whatever, but actually they don't have, that's all they have, you know, they, yeah. they, they've just, they, they don't have, like you said, the fun, like fun is such a huge part of our lives that people, we forget. Yeah. It's almost like we've had it knocked out of us, like the older we get, yes. you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. been, for me, having a daughter has been one of the greatest lessons ever. I'm like, my goodness, I love having fun and I've always loved having fun, but I felt like maybe I'd stopped having a bit of fun, you know, yeah. in my life. And now I'm just like, yeah. she makes me see the world like, it's about fun, daddy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, the other thing which I really like there is, is the intention, you know, like I think if yeah. people actually approach life with intention uh, and like specific circumstances in their life with intention, like even like say this podcast that you and I are doing, you know, like I was like, cool my intention is to get X and X and X out of the podcast, you know, like, like set that, have that little bit of that vision yeah. just for each interaction. And you'll be amazing. You'll, you'll be amazed at like how much, uh, you know, how much you'll get from it. You know, when you actually set a bit of an intention rather than just going in there blind or, you know, like not having a clue what you're doing sort of thing. So super cool, man. Thanks a lot for, for sharing that. Yeah. I think so many people would benefit from just sort of, thinking and articulating a life purpose and and that's what this substance can do um it can it can make that clear it actually sort of separates you from you can actually observe yourself from afar and say why am i doing that why am i acting like that why am i causing this conflict in my life or why am i allowing this conflict to affect my life it gives you some separation from some of your issues and you can actually look at it as almost like a third party and that's it's incredibly cathartic you know a lot of people compare it to a hundred therapy sessions i don't know if it's that powerful for everybody but uh i know people who've been in talk therapy for years and haven't had the impact of a couple uh psychedelic therapy sessions so it's going to be more and more prevalent I encourage people to explore it. Um, it's not for everybody, that's for sure. But it's it's incredibly impactful for a lot of people. That's super cool. Chris, um, if people want to uh, find out a bit more about you, a bit more about the retreat, obviously you've mentioned the, the website already, but like just about yeah. yourself, like what's the best way for them to to do that? Yeah, go to the Twitter and search for Car Wash Guy. I've got that kind of yellow uh, bubble behind my head. Um, it's Chrisberg tweets. I'm sure you'll have it in your show notes there. That's that's the easiest way. I I kind of thought about doing all the socials, you know, getting on TikTok and YouTube and I don't know, Instagram or whatever it is. I have zero <laughs> desire to do all that. I have a lot of fun interacting with people on Twitter. Uh, if you go to my bio, you can jump on my newsletter. I call it Side Hustle Central, and I created that for people who are want to do entrepreneurship but want to kind of ease into it. Um, because I think a ton of people just don't have the option to go all in. And so Side Hustle Central talks about a lot of these things that you can do if you have a W-2 or if you're a stay-at-home dad or a stay-at-home mom, you can do this stuff on the side. And so that's kind of a fun newsletter. But Twitter's the best way. Send me a DM and we'll talk or uh, just send me a reply. And, and I have a bunch of highlights on my bio now that you can kind of go through my stuff. That's super cool. And my last question for you is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Ridiculously human. Um, I, I have realized that my identity is um, being a healer on some level. Now, being a healer for some reason means like, for some people, it means like you wave this incense around and you are healing people's chakras and stuff. For me, it's it's trying to make people and places and things better, trying to improve. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my supplement business, we're we're literally are healing some people's ailments with breakthrough. We can heal people through um, the psychological retreats, psychedelic retreats, 
and even it sounds silly but even the car washes like when we improve these places and dress them up and make them work better make them function better we notice the neighborhood improves you know the neighbors start taking a little care better care of their places our car washes kind of become uh, a cool place to hang out people come and play their music really loud and have fun you know and, and there's an interaction there's a vibe there so for me it's 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 being a healer uh, on some level i don't i don't mean to be grandiose about that but um making things better and improving the lives of the people around me that's that's my purpose i think like when you are of service to people it just gives you something else you know this like your own yeah. sense of purpose and uh yeah yeah it, it, it definitely yeah it's a great thing to do so chris i just wanted to say you know like thanks so much for coming on the podcast it really has just been super cool chatting to you. Like I, you know, we yeah, didn't even yeah. touch on like what you actually do. You know, we, we didn't touch <laughs> on like, you know, how people know about you, I guess, on Twitter, like the, the car wash yeah. guy, you know, it's like, yeah, like, you'll see all that on Twitter. I'm glad we got into all this other stuff, Garrett. It's great questions. And, and I talk about car washes on podcasts all the time. There's a hundred <laughs> of those. These were way better. This was a way better conversation. I think that's cool and that's like that's what i try and do like to be honest with you like you know you you have spoken about those things fifty thousand yeah. times you know what i mean so this is yeah. i think people like the deep stuff you know and like that's where a lot of the, the sort of lessons are so thanks so much for sharing that it, it's just been super cool and i just wish you the best in in absolutely everything and um yeah it was a great time thanks buddy you too gareth keep going with the show i really like it i really do thank you cheers buddy 